My name is Cameron Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast, and all we do is tell stories, and if you like good stories, you have found your people. Someone sent me an email a couple of weeks ago, and they said, you know, you're always in such a good mood on your podcast, and you never complain about anything, but I'm going to complain about something right here. First time ever, I'm going to make a complaint. I'm so upset with the Bluebell Ice Cream Company that my face is turning red. They discontinued the salted caramel cookie ice cream that they made two years ago, and my wife and I have been looking for it ever since. We came across a caramel brownie brand that they have or flavor that they have, and I was quite disappointed. I like the salted caramel cookie, and they only made it for, I think, two weeks. I'm telling you, I'm considering becoming a community organizer and, and organizing a protest at some blue bell food processing plant close to me. And I'm going to sit there and go on a hunger strike till they start making that ice cream again. So if you didn't think I ever complained about anything, I'm really pissed at the Blue Bell Ice Cream Company. And if there's anybody listening that works for Blue Bell or knows someone who works at Blue Bell, I would humbly submit to you that you bring back the salted caramel cookie ice cream. That's my biggest complaint for the year. All right, I got several stories in this podcast, and I think you guys are going to enjoy this. Let's get rolling with it. All right, here we go. All right, this is a good this is a good email. I really enjoyed reading this. When I was still a bachelor, my brother and I found a place that we could rent in Parowan, Utah. Now I know I pronounced it wrong. P A R O W A N. I know it's I know it's probably not pronounced the way it's spelled, but I'm calling it Parowan. Parowan, Utah. When I was still a bachelor, my brother and I found a place that we could rent in Parowan, Utah for a very good deal. It was a farmhouse in the middle of about 240 acres. It had a shop and plenty of room for our horses, which was exactly what we were looking for. The house had been vacant for several years and needed a lot of fixing and cleaning up around the farm, which became my responsibility in the rent agreement. We cleaned out some old grain silos that had old clothes, furniture, and personal belongings of the previous owner. We were instructed to throw it all away, but there was a lot of useful things that we could use in the house and the shop. There was an old rocking chair and kitchen items and tools that I couldn't reason to throw away. I cleaned them up and I brought them in the house. Most of the items were quite old and outdated, like the old cotton rugs and old radios you would see when you visit your grandmother's house. We even found a box of pictures and personal information that we didn't look into at first. We made our living pretty much right there on the property with our horse training business. Every other week, however, I would leave for a part-time apprenticeship job and be gone for four days. My brother would stay behind and take care of the animals. My brother is one of those cowboys you see that likes to carry around a big knife on his hip. It was one he made himself out of a rasp and he never goes anywhere without it. Well, one morning when we were having breakfast, he told me his knife was missing off of his belt, sheath and all. We both figured it had to be close by and given the fact that he couldn't function without knowing its whereabouts, We searched everywhere, but we never found it. The next day, I had to leave for my apprentice job, so I helped one more time, and I said, Look, man, I'm sorry, I gotta go. I hope you find it soon. And then I left. Well, what happened the night after I left was hard to believe at first. My brother said that it was a cold night, so he bundled up with a lot of covers and curled up for the night. And when he woke up, he felt something putting pressure on the top of him. There was a little bit of morning light coming through the window so he could see just a little bit. And he saw what was weighing down on him. Resting on his blanket-covered shoulder was his big knife that had vanished. He was alone in the house, or who or what could have done that? It had been missing for two days and randomly shows up in the middle of the night, right on top of him, while he slept. 
There was no one else on the property but him. He told me this story over the phone, and he said he wasn't going to stay alone in the house, so I arranged to come home the next night, and I also invited some friends over. Well, we were all laughing and having a good time when a plate from the dish drainer flew across the room and busted to pieces. Our friend said in a monotone voice, there's no way that's a coincidence. After that happened, someone suggested that we didn't have any strange occurrences until we brought all those belongings into the house. We started going through the old files to find more information on who used to live there. There were pictures of the house when it was first built in the 1970s and a lot of pictures of the old couple who lived there. I didn't find any evidence of any children and most of the pictures were of a woman that we figured had been widowed while she lived there. We found a driver's license, a social security card, and an obituary in a Ziploc bag of a lady that was in most of the pictures. And here's what we gathered. Her name was Margaret. She, at some point, lived in California and moved to Idaho and then to the farmhouse in Utah. I thought she looked like a sweet old lady, and we found out that she used to be a cowgirl model back in California. When she was younger, she had a very attractive figure. She was tall with brown hair and a beautiful smile, and it seemed like she was a happy and successful person. I gathered that she was a Christian based on the crosses she had stored. Perhaps she thought that we were getting a little too rowdy and she threw a dish to make a statement. It was a shame that there was no family or offspring that cared to collect any of her belongings. I don't believe she had anyone at the end of her life. I'm hoping I'm wrong. After that, I said aloud, Hi, Margaret. If you're still around here, then I'll try to live here with respect, and I just ask that you stop teasing my brother. He's a little flighty. Oh, and also, if you see me walking around naked, just turn the other way so I have a bit of privacy around here. (laughs) That's the thing with ghosts. They could be in the bathroom with you while you're taking a shower. Holy smokes. Okay, on with the letter. We had a few more strange occurrences, such as doors opening and footsteps, And every time it would happen, I would say, oh, it's just Margaret. My brother moved his horse training business and he left not long after this all happened. And I continued to live there for another year. And I didn't have any other strange occurrences after he left. And that's the end of his email. And I, man, what an interesting story. And this guy's got a great, uh, he's got a great attitude about all this. As a matter of fact, a bit of humor there at the end. I don't know about these ghosts. I don't know much about Bigfoot. I don't know much about any of this stuff, but I think these are great stories, and this was a good one. So thank you to the to the writer for sending it. I really appreciate it. This is an email I thought was interesting, and it is a little bit of a it is a little bit of a story, but it is also in response to some of my silly commentary that I made on a video just a couple of weeks ago, but I'll just read the email to you, but this is interesting. He says, uh, I'd prefer my name and email not be used, even though, as I've said before, the ship has already sailed in regard to people thinking I'm crazy. LOL, he writes. This is in reference to a comment that you made about elders with dementia in the video Bigfoot Kills a Rogue Gugwe. Now, no worries, I'm not attacking or complaining but rather suggesting an alternative explanation for occurrences of that sort. In any case, funny thing, back several weeks to a month ago when my dad was in rehab, after having a pacemaker installed, he kept complaining for three or four days about being able to hear a conversation in his room in the wee hours of the morning between two people who weren't there. We checked the area around the room, and on one side there was in fact another room, and the walls in the place were notoriously thin. But on the nights in question, no one was in that room, so it would have been unlikely that he would have heard any voices from that source. The other side of the room shared a wall with a nurse's station that was only occupied during the day, and a broom closet on the adjoining hallway that was never used. 
Several others who had been assigned to that room, I was told by one of the orderlies, or maybe it was a nurse, I can't remember, had reported and complained about similar occurrences there. He said that he didn't know, but maybe that room was haunted. There had been at least one death in the room, he said. One of the residents apparently overheard and later told me that several people had had similar experiences that he had heard about. All of that made me think about your comment in the Bigfoot Kills a Rogue Gugwe video about people in nursing homes walking around talking to people who weren't or aren't there. Maybe the people those residents are talking to are really there. Maybe they're ghosts or similar. Or you and the staff just couldn't see them. And as I said, maybe that's an alternative explanation to just dementia. I'm reminded of Terry Pratchett's line about wizards. Something to the effect that wizards can see what's really there. Maybe the elders who are talking to the air, as it were, are actually conversing with someone invisible who is really there. And that could very well be the case. Uh, the per Whoever they're talking to, in just a few instances I've seen in the nursing home, like I refer to people who don't know what I'm talking about, I was talking about visiting my mother-in-law in a nursing home. I, I haven't spent much time in nursing homes. My grandmother was in one for years, and we would go see her, but we would just go straight to her room and sit with her for a couple hours, and then we'd leave. We didn't really interact with the other patients at the uh, at the care facility. But in this case, this nursing home, retirement home, whatever you want to call it here, uh, seemed to be a little more maybe crowded. I'm not sure how you would say that, but the people were more active and they would walk around and there were a couple that I would see just talking. They'd just be sitting there like you walk by their rooms, all the rooms are open and they're just sitting there on their bed just talking to somebody. I, I, I don't know what it is. And I don't know if someone is there or not. There's so many mysteries to this and what happens to the mind. When we get old or we or if we begin to experience the effects of dementia and Alzheimer's, and I don't know the connection between the two, I, I pretty much just know it's two different words, and one of, them mean one, one of them means one thing, one of them means the other, and I know there's experts out there, your parents or someone you know, your wife, spouse, somebody's had Alzheimer's and dementia. So I, I'm not trying to be an expert on any of this. The point was, is that they're talking to somebody, and in their mind... There is somebody there that they see. Uh, I could tell you some stories about my my, my mother-in-law had a roommate. It was a, um, she was just living on Social Security and you have to, they stack people up in rooms. She was very comfortable. Everything was working out pretty good. I Honestly, I don't really think she knew where she was, but uh, she was happy. She was always smiling and she was a lovely, lovely woman and I miss her terribly. Uh, my wife does too. But her roommate would often go off on these tirades about people she would see in the corner and she would be screaming at them, screaming at them in the corner and saying uh, really, really kind of strange stuff. And so she was seeing or imagining someone and maybe there was someone bad, some entity bad there in the corner. Actually, she was kind of pointing. At first, I thought she was pointing at me and I was like, you're not talking to me, are you? She, she never acknowledged me. She just kept pointing and saying, and I can't tell you what she was saying. It was kind of, it was kind of creepy, but she was a sweet old lady and she passed away a couple of months after that. But maybe there was some kind of evil entity in the corner sitting, you know, I don't know. Maybe it was ready to pounce on me. Who knows? But anyway, all that to say, I uh, thought this email was interesting. I thought I'd share it with you has nothing to do with cryptids, but you know me, I'm always doing something different. So let's go to another story. This story, the writer's name is Dave Knuckles. The story is claimed to be true, and the topic is Bigfoot. It was early November 1984. The place was Williamette National Forest, 30 miles east of Eugene, Oregon. Our story starts with a man named Rene Dupree. Rene was of Cajun descent, 
born and raised around Lake Charles, Louisiana. His father, Bill, was a fisherman and a trapper by trade. From the time they could walk, Renee and his brother, Bill Jr., everyone called him Bill Jr. except his mama, who called him Little Bill, were out in the swamp fishing, crabbing, catching crawfish and turtles. If it was in the swamp and they can make a living on it or put it on the table, they knew how to hunt it, catch it, skin it, cook it, and eat it. By the time the boys were grown, they had their own boats and traps. They were happily entrenched in running the family business. Renee would ping a few muskrats and ducks for dinner, but hunting never really appealed to him. He wasn't against it. He was a Cajun after all. Each year he would buy gator tags, and if someone wanted him to get rid of a pesky gator, he would do it. But that was about it. Back when Rene was eight years old, his grandfather, Boudreaux, the boys called him Pappy, took the boys deer hunting in Plaquemines Parish. Bill got his deer right away. When it was Rene's turn to shoot, he couldn't pull the trigger. Boudreaux asked him, Why didn't you shoot, boy? Rene teared up, handing the gun to the old man. Pappy, it was just too alive to kill, he said. The old man placed his hand on Renee's shoulder and comforted him. It's okay, not like a big old muskrat, huh? They field-dressed Bill's deer and slowly made their way back to the jeep, the old man lumbering with the hundred pounds of venison packed on his back. On their way, they came across the carcass of a large buck. It had been caped out with only the back straps and tenderloins removed. The old man sat his pack down and called the boys over, and in his thick Cajun accent, tinged with anger, he spoke, You see this? This is wrong. This is a crime against nature. God, he put the animals here for us to eat, not to sport. No, never for trophy, never. He leaned forward to the boys for effect. If you kill something and take that life that God gave and you don't eat it, it'd be a sin, boys. Rene rarely carried a gun on his boat. He went happily about his life in the world, marveling at nature and fishing in the swamp. In the fall of 1974, everything changed. Rene was way up a bayou in a cypress swamp checking his traps for crawfish. He found two of them destroyed, thrown up on the bank with the wire screen torn away. It made him angry. He could fix them well enough when he got home, but it was the insult in it. Must have been them damn Yankees, he thought. To a Cajun, anyone born outside the swamp is a Yankee. Even a Florida native would be a Yankee to a Cajun. There's a code to the swamp. You know everyone in the swamp and you know their traps. If you happen to be fishing next to one, you don't mess with it. If the trap is tangled or in need of repair... You either call the owner or fix it yourself. To do less is considered stealing. As warm as the Cajun folk are, they do not cotton the thieves. Rene, suspicious now that the thief was still in the area, cut his motor and pulled around to the next bend, hoping to catch him red-handed. The thief was there, but it wasn't a man. Rene heard the stories and believed in the swamp Sasquatch, but he had never seen one. Now there was one standing several yards down the bank, tearing up his trap. Rene was surprised. He could not believe what he was seeing. He watched silently for a moment before whispering, What you got there, fella? The squatch whirled around quickly, but Rene continued speaking softly. So you like them crawfishes, huh? The big animal held its gaze on Rene while gathering the ends of an old shirt that it was using as a pouch to hold the stolen crawfish. Rene's boat drifted closer. You know them's my crawfish, dear fella, Rene continued soothingly. But before he could finish the sentence, and quicker than his eyes could follow, the squatch threw the trap at him, hitting him square in the chest, knocking him backwards into the water. By the time he managed to get back on his feet in the slick mud, the Sasquatch and his crawfish were gone. 
He stared, dumbfounded, at the spot where the creature had been, as the muck and filth dripped from his body. But all he could do now was laugh. After that, Renee spent a lot less time fishing and a lot more time poling up and down those backwaters looking for the foots. He asked all the folks he knew if they had ever seen one. He was infatuated with the beast now. He heard about a Bigfoot meeting in Mobile and he drove a hundred miles to attend. He watched a film there and listened to the lectures. During the question and answer periods, he asked, If I wanted to see one, where would be the best place to look? They conferred with each other before declaring that the Pacific Northwest was the best place. If that's where they are, he told himself, then that's where I'm going to be. He quickly sold his boat, traps and nets and other equipment, mostly to his brother, and headed for Bigfoot country. He ended up in Oregon where he found a job working for the forestry service at the Williamette National Forest. Here he was able to search while on the job. It was 1984 and muzzleloading season and Rene was checking in a man named John Scope and his 14-year-old son Danny. They were there for Danny's first deer hunt. Certain they were abiding by all of the stringent Oregon rules for youth hunters, Renee pulled out a map and showed them which trails to take to reach the regulated hunting area. Taking a hard look at the boy for the first time, he noted his pale complexion and his trembling hands. Is he okay? he asked the father. Oh yeah, he's fine. Just first hunt jitters. Renee was taken immediately back to his first hunt. Mentally, he decided, since he'd worked the night shift and the sun was breaking on the horizon, that he would go up and check on the boy as soon as he got off work. He'd seen too much of himself in the kid's eyes. As Rene pulled into the gravel parking lot at the foot of the trail up to the youth hunting area, three gunshots rang out in rapid succession. It was a call for help. He jumped from his vehicle and ran up the steep trail, finding John waving his arms at the entry gate. John, he yelled, where's Danny? It got him, John answered through sobs. It got my boy. Calm down, Renee told him. What got him? I don't know. It was a monster. We saw a deer through the brush, and when Danny flanked to get the better shot at him, show me now, Renee demanded. John led Renee through the gate into the meadow where the thick line of small trees and brush marked the edge. Renee whispered to John, You stay here. If you hear me holler, you come running. Then he added, Reload your gun and be ready to shoot if need be. Before slowing, making his way through the brush line, the 200 feet or so to where the meadow opened, he'd wanted badly to see a Sasquatch, but not like this. As he drew closer, he heard a low, soft whistling sound like a flute being played ever so softly. Then, as he rounded the brush pile, he saw something that his mind could not accept. Standing there was a creature with the body of a goat, or maybe a deer or something, with long, straggly hair not quite the color of auburn, but not quite brown either. Most unbelievably... Where the neck should have been sprung a torso of a boy no more than eight years of age. The human part was pale and freckled with the long, thin arms and the typical features of a child, except for a long red goatee on his chin. Two small horns jutted out of the mass of red curls on his head. This strange creature stood before Danny, cupping its hands to its mouth, creating the soft, flute like whistle. It seemed to be dancing side to side and back and forth, all the while staring into Danny's eyes. Danny never moved. He was frozen in place, mesmerized by the strangely magical creature that seemed more like something out of a Disney movie or a fairy tale than any kind of reality. It would have been comical if it weren't for its obvious intent on Danny. Renee moved forward slowly, hands up, palms forward to show that he was unarmed. In that same quiet voice he had used on that swamp squat so many years before, he said, Hey fella. 
The beast looked towards Rene for a split second before returning his gaze to Danny. Rene continued speaking softly. The boy, he didn't mean no harm. The thing gestured with its chin towards Danny, and Rene continued to walk forward. The gun, huh? Okay, I'll fix that. He walked slowly over and tried to remove the gun from Danny's grasp, but Danny was frozen in place. The gun wouldn't come free. Rene tried to lift Danny to point him and the gun in the other direction. It was as if Danny was rooted to the ground. Rene could not even begin to lift him, so he stepped between Danny and the creature and then backed deliberately into the gun barrel until it pressed into his own flesh. If Danny tried to shoot, the bullet would have to go through him to hit the creature. At this realization, the creature quit his little dance. The tune he was playing grew a bit louder. It bowed to Rene, it leapt, and then leapt again. With the third leap, it bounded into a flash of light and was gone. Rene dove to the ground in a split second before Danny pulled the trigger. The melody of the flute was gone with the creature replaced by the fading, distant echo of a child's laugh. At the sound of Danny's gunfire, John bolted onto the scene, frantically waving his gun. When he saw Danny standing there with Rene lying on the ground, he slowed to a stumbling walk and tried to reholster his gun, dropping it to the ground instead. Rene stood up and pushed the barrel of Danny's gun towards the ground as the boy, released from his trance, began to tremble and cry. Rene put his hand on a shaking shoulder and said, Not like shooting a big old muskrat, is it? It's okay, son, it's okay, John said comfortingly. Danny looked down at the gun, still in his hand, and threw it to the ground. Through great wailing sobs, he told his father, I don't want to hunt anymore. John led Danny back down the path. Rene picked up the muzzleloader and the pistol, looked around one last time for the creature. It was as if it had never been there, and then he followed them back to their vehicle. John was sitting in his truck, staring out to space. Danny was busy crying himself to sleep next to him. When Rene approached, John got out. His demeanor had changed. He shook Renee's hand and he hugged him. Thank you for saving my boy, but we're not filling out any damn report, he said tersely. Okay, Renee said. I'll call you in a couple of days. Don't bother. I won't answer, John told him. Well, here, let me get your guns then. Keep them. We're done, was all John said. With that, he was back in the truck and they drove away. The pistol and the muzzleloader are still locked in a safe at the ranger station. Rene is no longer there. He moved toward Washington State in the general area of Mount Hood. Someone told him he might find what he's looking for there. I wish him well. Here's a note from the writer. I tried to contact the people involved before I committed myself to writing it down, but a lot of years and some bad storms have come and gone. The story is just as I heard it. I changed the names to protect their privacy. The sad truth is Rene was hurt when that trap hit him in the swamp. He almost drowned when he fell back into the water. The part about him selling all of his stuff in a hurry is true too. He wanted to get as far away from that swamp as possible. All right, here's a story I came across recently. uh, It's an email sent to me recently. Normally, I dig back. I have emails going back to uh, to 2019 that I haven't gotten to yet. But uh, I'm still working on them. But this one jumped out. It's come in the last couple of months, and I just thought it was fascinating. And... Uh, as you listen to it, it might be a little heartbreaking for you, but it is a very compelling and interesting story. So I'm going to read every word the writer says here. If you decide to use this, please just use my first name only. I'm not going to use his name at all, but uh, he'll know it when he hears this. And if you decide it's too personal or doesn't fit, I totally understand. I appreciate being able to tell someone the story, even if it isn't used. 
It is a story about tragedy and true terror. I will never forget this poor woman and her baby. I think every state has a legend about a haunted bridge where a young mother and her infant were lost on a rainy night, swept over a bridge, and drowned. The legends are usually about the crying of the mother for her lost infant. Our own county has such a legend called Cry Woman's Bridge. The bridge is no longer there and the county abandoned the road back in the 1990s. And the landowners are not receptive to anyone trespassing to find the old bridge remains. This legend was born south of Dublin, Indiana and can easily be found on websites about Hoosier hauntings. Is the legend true? No one can say as the story is always told that the mother was not from the area and was not familiar with the back county roads. There's never a name attached to the legends. The story I'm going to tell you is true though. There are names and even though this incident took place 20 years ago, I will omit them from this narrative to do my best to protect the family's identity. I do not want to cause anyone anguish, but in case someone who knew the victims reads the story, I want them to know that I tell this so that they are not forgotten. It was a January night back in the year 2000. Our area was inundated with torrential rain all that afternoon and into the night. Close to 10 inches of rain fell over a span of a few hours on frozen ground. The flooding was the worst that I can ever remember. The water could not soak into the ground, and it all ended up in the ditches and the creeks and the river. I was off duty that evening, and my wife and I were keeping watch on our basement, hoping that it would not flood and short out our furnace. We live in an old farmhouse with a rock-walled dirt floor cellar, which on occasion gets water in it. Around nine, the phone rang and it was a county dispatch asking if I could go on duty and help to evacuate some people along a street that were in danger of having water get into their houses. This was in a town three miles east of where I lived. I didn't put on my uniform, but I took my duty belt and I donned a raincoat that identified me as a law enforcement officer, and I headed to town. When I arrived on the west side of town, water was running over the highway about ankle deep. I drove down to the street that was being flooded by a small creek that in normal weather could be leaped across and I saw that the water was at the front door of the houses. The fire department was helping people out of their homes and assisting them to higher ground behind their houses and I asked the police chief how I could assist and he instructed me to go several blocks away to the main street and stop any non-first responder traffic from driving down to the area being evacuated. As I stood at this intersection, I heard a call from my portable radio that put the tragic events of that night in motion. County dispatch called for an officer to investigate a report about car headlights in the river below a certain bridge south of town. I remember thinking that anyone in that river that night would never survive. Forty minutes later, an officer called in a negative contact on any headlights in the river. He reported that the river level was up to the bottom of the bridge, but was not over the bridge itself. He recommended that dispatch contact County Highway to post road close signs east and west of the bridge, and that was the last I heard about that until the next day. When I was told that I wasn't needed any longer that night, I headed home. And on the west side of town, the water over the highway that had been ankle deep earlier was now two to three feet deep. There were some firemen there to stop people from driving into the water. I was in a four-wheel drive vehicle and I told them that I was sure I could make it through the water. And to be truthful, it was a stupid decision. But I was wet, and I was tired, and I wanted to get home. The firemen said that I was a deputy so if I wanted to chance it, that I was on my own. I drove into the water slowly, and once for a brief instant felt the vehicle begin to drift to my left, but the tires caught and I made it through safely. Now this is a true do-as-I-say-and-not-as-I-do moment. 
The next day, I learned what really happened with the headlights in the river. It turned out that someone reported the headlights in the river accurately, but they reported the wrong bridge. The following is a true terror part of this incident. Along the river to the south are four bridges. The bridge in the report was actually the third bridge. Visibility was terrible that night as the rain was falling in sheets. There was a young woman who lived in this very rural area who was on her way to work on her third shift job. In her car was her infant daughter, who she was taking to a sitter before reporting to work. She had to cross the river over this particular bridge, which was not like most bridges. The bridge is at the base of a steep ridge, and the western entrance to the bridge is on the high ground, with a T-road intersection just west of the bridge. On the east side of the bridge, the road drops steeply from the bridge to the river floodplain below, and it's a poor place for a bridge to be built, in my opinion. This woman was driving east, and she came down from the high ridge west of the river and crossed the bridge. And when she descended the east side of the bridge, her car hit the water in the floodplain, and the current immediately began to drift her car south over a cornfield. The water was four feet deep, and the current was rapid. Her car was swept across the field and eventually became lodged in a tree line at the field's south edge. And here, for reasons that will forever be unknown to me, she made the decision to attempt to walk back out to the road. This was at a time when most people did not have cell phones. Even if she had possessed one, it would likely not have worked where she was, as there were no cell towers around that area at the time. So the mother and the infant abandoned the car, and she began what had to be the most terrifying walk that I can imagine. She was wading in swift waist to chest deep water in total darkness over a picked cornfield with her baby in her arms. Then came the moment that I can't even comprehend the terror, the moment when she lost her footing and her baby was torn from her arms by the icy river. They were both lost that horrible night. Mother and daughter were found the next day down the river. Many speculate that had she stayed in her car, they might have survived. Now, I don't know. I doubt they could have survived the hypothermia until daylight if they had stayed in the car as it had filled up with water. But here, I want you to pause and put yourself in her place at that moment. It's total darkness. You have a baby in your arms in a flooded field trying to make it to safety. Can you think of anything more terrifying? I can't. The next spring, the woman's family erected a trellis east of the bridge where the road forks. The trellis had the names of the victims and had roses planted on both sides of it. However, the monument didn't last long as eventually another flood came along and tore away the trellis and roses. The only reminder to that night are the two gates one on the west end of the bridge and another at the fork in the road east of the bridge that the county closes in times of flood. And I guess those gates are now their memorial. This is one instance where I know for certain that any legend that may be spawned from this tragedy would be based in fact. And the writer signs off. Okay, this guy's a cop. Look. Policemen have to see and experience the most horrible things. You just heard this story, and I know, I mean, I'm there in the last two or three paragraphs, and I'm about to break down crying. I can't, I, I'm just thinking about my wife and my daughter and what she would do in that situation. I just can't imagine, but God bless them. Oh, what can you say? What can you say? And so the people that are left have to deal with these memories, and if I had to guess the man who wrote this, even though he wasn't there and didn't see all this happen, he was quite close to all the action that night, knew how cold it was, knew how that water was moving, and he has to deal with this, and these first responders and cops and and firefighters, and they just deal with hard stuff, I mean hard stuff, and I raise my beer to them, They're they're just 
fantastic people in that respect. So uh, it's probably not one of the most <laughs> common stories that I do, but it really caught my eye and I thought I would share it with you all. So, and I'm not going to say I hope you enjoyed this story. You know, these things happen and that's the story of this woman and her little daughter. They're at peace now. All right, a few weeks ago, I got a couple of emails from guys who had run into Steve Lilly and his crew while doing various things. I've got several more, and I thought I would uh, share this one with you and end this podcast up in a with a happy note. Uh, so this gentleman writes this story, and he says, uh, I opened my eyes, and I looked at the clock, and it was 4 a.m. I rolled out of bed, and I had coffee, and I got suited up and got my thermos of coffee and some sandwiches ready. It's the first day of rifle deer season in Vermont, and I grabbed my backpack, my rifle, and a handful of ammo, and I started from my deer stand that I set up two weeks ago. Well, I saw my breath, and a wave of cold air hit me, making me want to go back into my warm bed, and I slung my backpack over my shoulder, and I started to walk to my tree stand. I needed to gut through it. Thirty minutes later, I was in my tree stand, and I looked at my watch, and it was 5.30 a.m., so I started to get comfortable. I saw headlights coming down the dirt road. It turned down the dirt driveway and stopped, and the lights went off, and everything went silent, and I thought, probably hunting back on the old Stevenson's place, and I settled back in, and I got comfortable. It was an hour later and the sun was up pretty good, but I didn't see any activity. The birds were quiet and a flock of turkeys I heard this morning hadn't even made an appearance. Another 30 minutes and I don't hear anything in the woods. There were no squirrels, no footsteps in the leaves on the ground. And then I heard two car doors slam. And then I hear gunshots. And then a tall, hairy person started running at my tree stand. I could see four bullet wounds on him. There were three in the chest and one in its thigh, and it kept charging at me. And I chambered around, and I aimed for where I thought the heart would be, and I fired. And it kept running for a few minutes, but it dropped like a rock. And I slowly lowered my rifle, and I took a deep breath. I thought, how am I going to explain this? What is this thing? A few minutes later, I heard someone in front of me say, Well, that's nice shooting there, brother. Glad you didn't go for the head. I was so focused on the creature on the ground, I didn't notice the two men walking up. Well, I climbed down, and I walked over, and I introduced myself. Hey, y'all, my name's Tater. Hey, my name's Steve, and this is Hook. After the introductions, I noticed Hook cutting off this thing's head. Why are you cutting off its head, I said, and what is this thing? You don't know what this is? This is a Squatch. It's a Bigfoot. We need it so we can get paid. There are three more over that hill. Now look, we're going to share the money with you because you finished this one off, Steve said. You get paid for doing this, I asked. Well, yeah, you know, ammo and gas ain't cheap. Hook said, well, originally we came up here to fish, but we got called to do this job. Man, that's a sweet gig, I said. We shook hands and they walked off with these heads and I never saw them again. And on my way home, I thought to myself, how am I going to explain the shots that were fired up here and I'm not coming home with any deer? I'm going to be made fun of for that. Steve Lilly is in Vermont. What? What? I didn't even know that. Anyway, you guys keep sending these Steve Lilly encounter stories. He seems to be getting around quite a bit. Thanks to the writer for letting us know you ran into old Steve Lilly. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you thought it was good, give me a thumbs up, maybe even subscribe. Main thing I want you to do is come back for the next podcast that I release or go back through my library. I've got over 300 videos and podcasts up. You can also find this podcast on the podcast network, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Audible, anywhere you find your podcast. If you'll do a search for What If It's True Podcast. A lot of people are complaining about buffering on the YouTube channel. Guys, I've told you a hundred times, if you just download a podcast app like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, subscribe to the What If It's True podcast, you get all these episodes and it saves you about 90% of your data and about 90% of your battery use. 
you're just not used looking at an image, but you're getting the full experience of the Dixie Cryptid Podcast. And sometimes there are a lot less ads. You gotta go check it out. All right, thanks again for joining me on this podcast, and we'll see you guys on the next one. Love you all. Mm-hmm.